When I think of amateur boxing, I think of a beginning little boy, a little girl nowadays, that goes to a gym and is just jumping around, wanting to learn how to throw a punch, uh, uh, maybe to try to win a little trophy, to do something that maybe they, especially for little kids who are physically small and would not be able to necessarily grow and compete in basketball and football and, and the other sports that require someone to be big. I see a lot of the influence and power in amateur boxing today is as a result of fathers. Who, everyone is particular viewing the success of all these recent multi-million dollar fighters such as the Roy Joneses and Oscar De La Hoyas, Shane Mosley's and the Floyd Mayweather Juniors because of the success of these kids who were almost forced into boxing by their fathers. You see a lot of fathers in the gym now more than ever, even in my gym back at the Crunk Gym, uh, where there used to be just the boxers coming in, the kids coming in on their own. I'd say about probably 60% of the kids who are boxing in my gym and the amateur program are accompanied by their parents today, whether it's fathers or mothers, which is amazing. I started boxing when I was seven years old and I got a pair of boxing gloves for a Christmas gift. Even though I had a lot of other toys and train sets and other things, I was just totally fascinated by this game of jumping around, hitting someone, making them miss you, hit them, let them miss you. And there was no really boxing on TV or no particular person or no parent that was involved with me. I was just totally fascinated, I guess, naturally by boxing. And I started having boxing matches when I was eight years old and uh, did very well as a little peewee boxer. I had about 15 fights, uh, probably never lost any of them. This was in West Virginia. And when I came to Detroit with my parents' divorce when I was 11, I didn't go to a boxing club or anything, so I started getting into street fights. And by the time I was 14, I was in serious trouble with the police for street fighting. Not gang fighting, I mean street fighting is a little different. And uh, they were going to put me away permanently. Uh, and as a result, uh, they struck a deal when my mother told her that I used to box when I was young in West Virginia. So they said, if you go to a recreation center, and in six months' time, we see that you're still there, you don't get in any trouble we had tried to suspend from sending you away to a juvenile. And so I went to the recreation center and uh, won the uh, city junior championship. Then I won it the next year, then I won it the next year. And then I never had the time to even get in any street fights anymore. And the uh, next thing I know, uh, four years later when I was 18, I was a National Golden Gloves champion of the United States. And instead of being on the front page or the crime page in Detroit, I was uh, being feeded and treated royally when I came home to the first uh, Golden Glove champion in 24 years and all of that. So I feel that uh, boxing, amateur boxing really was crucial in changing my life. I graduated from high school, an honor student, and all because of boxing. Uh, when, after winning the National Golden Glove Tournament of Champion in 1963, I was going to turn professional because I couldn't go any further as an amateur boxer. And I couldn't find what I call good management for professional boxing. And the only really good offer I got was a group of guys who wanted me to move to California. They offered me a tremendous amount of money at that time, which was $100,000. It's a lot of money, but I would have to relocate and leave my mother and two younger sisters who I primarily was supporting. So I chose to stay in Detroit, and uh, as a result, I became an uh, electrician for Detroit Edison and was doing very well and then I had a younger half brother who moved in to live with me and he was 14 years old and he said he wanted to start boxing so by taking him to the closest recreation center after I got off of my job at Edison uh, which was a place called Crunk and this was in 1969 so accidentally I went there just to take my brother to three days a week to work him out and uh, he won the Golden Gloves Championship the next year I had seven kids I put in, and they all won the Golden Gloves Championship, and the story went all over the country. Young coach in Detroit only produces champions. I was 26, and that's when the Crunk legacy began, and even though I had about three years, I was totally out of boxing, didn't even miss it uh, after I'd gotten married, and uh, next thing I know, I'm back in it, and 
figured I would just be in it for a few years, hopefully the baby to develop somebody to win the golden medal in the Olympics. And here I am, about 35 or 40 years later, still in it. But it was all accidentally. I never planned to be a trainer. There was never any coach or trainer that I really learned from or emulated. I just did everything naturally. Boxing came uh, easy to me. I have great instincts for it. It's a gift. Unlike many guys who have been successful, even not so successful, they get into the professional boxing, they kind of look, it's like looking down the fact of going back and being involved with amateur boxing. They feel they're beyond that. And even though I've had success beyond any professional trainer in the history of boxing in terms of my accomplishments and championships, and I still love the amateur boxing. That's where my heart is. It was up to me. That's where I would spend all of my time because in going back to the amateur boxing, I have a chance to not only see myself, I have a chance to keep contact with reality. You, you see so many of the poor kids that are there, they are training, that recreation center is there, it's center of the universe for some of them. The, the situation at home is pretty bad sometimes for different reasons, maybe it's uh, financial, maybe it's even violence. And so those kids come there and they're beating those bags and looking at a way of maybe getting in, uh, getting out of poverty. Uh, many of the kids are, they'll ask me for 50 cents, could I get 50 cents, you know, and the 50 cent is to actually buy potato chips or something, because that is the only food that they'll have. And so one day I may be doing an HBO broadcast and I'm living in the big hotels in New York and Las Vegas, big suites, limousines picking me up and being involved with so many multi-million dollar situations and people. And then when I get back to the gym the next day and take off those tuxedos, it keeps me connected with reality that everybody isn't living the big life. And then I go right down to that little basement down at Crunk and that's where I'm the happiest because that's all of the little kids, a lot of the people who are older in life who have fell through the cracks, so to say, of our life and they're less fortunate and they're there, they're just as happy to see me and I go in and we talk and we hug and we start getting ready for one of the amateur tournaments and I love being in the tournaments when you see one kid fighting and then the next night you know he's going to be fighting the other kid that just won and I've learned to really be friends with all of the kids. I go to the tournaments whether they're my fighters from my club or whatever you know I take pictures with them and have a lot of fun with them and, uh, and that's the type of relationship that eventually ended up with me having a lot of the top professional fighters such as Evander Holyfield who in the amateur days his main nemesis was the crunk fighter a kid named Ricky Womack but I was always very good with Evander in fact I would wrap his hands when his coach wasn't there and, and he was fighting my own fighter but I would try to help him every day after my fighter had finished training never knowing that those type of relationships ended up with all of the fighters a lot of them uh, coming to me professionally but I, when I see a kid come into boxing right off the street the first thing I do is to teach him his balance and spend time with him and try to make him feel important. And a lot of times it just, maybe if he comes for about a week or two and he sees he's serious, I like to bring him a little t-shirts and stuff with his name on it. And a lot of kids just feel that they're part of a team or something. It take a lot of pride. And when we send some of the boxers to like a little amateur team tournament, if I have the uh, resources, I like to try to send some of the beginning kids with them so they can realize that by boxing there they get a chance to travel, which means a lot to particularly some of the poor kids who never get to travel anywhere. And uh, just spend maybe a week up there in a the tournament just watching all these guys, seeing what can happen, uh, seeing these guys get the medals around their necks, seeing the different tournament uh, activities. So I try to always spend time with the kids traveling. I think that's traveling is very important for kids. And a lot of kids who went on to be my world champions, Milton McCroy and Thomas Harris, they said the reason they liked the boxing when they was 12 and 13 as compared to the baseball teams that they played on when they was kids, because in the boxing they got to travel more. So just because of being on the boxing team, they got to travel and go all around the country. And they, uh, they would love the box and they quit the other sports. Boxers are different today than they were like everything else is to some degree. The kids are wanting to be more into business now, which is good and bad. Uh, and that's why you don't have any boxer, I say, dominating and having these great undefeated uh, records anymore because they are more into becoming the promoters and, uh, and sponsorships and instead of having certain people to take care of those areas and for them to focus strictly on boxing. 
the great boxers who had the tremendous uh, reigns where they was dominant, such as the Ali's and the marvelous Marvin Hagler's and Ray Leonard, those guys, they had people who took care of their business and they was focusing on being boxers. But today, nearly every boxer, after he wears a tile, he wants to be the promoter, he wants to do this. And so it's a difference. The, the uh, styles in the rings have changed. It's more showmanship. They're coming in more worried about the music that they're going to come in the ring on is sometimes more important than even the preparation, the, the training. I mean, these guys cannot even come out of the dressing room if they don't have that right music on now. It's, it's, it's changed. It's more show business, but it's like so many other things.